I'm a town planner, so I'm interested in the, uh, the context in which we use water, the urban context. Um, and I'm particularly interested in how we can reduce our water demand on the environment whilst retaining the quality of life that we're all used to. And we've seen that Australians are profligate users of water, so we have to reduce that water use somehow. My particular interest is on behaviour change. How can we bring about uh, a new set of behaviour uh, within the urban population which reduces our demands on the environment in terms of water? Education, appealing to conscience and technological fixes only take us so far. So we need to uh, look at how we could uh, address this issue of behaviour change more deeply. I think trying to change the framework conditions within which we operate is a really at the key to uh, making this, this happen. Now what do I mean by that? I think I mean looking at the, uh, dem the demand side of the equation rather than the supply side. Uh, so looking at the local resources that we have within the urban environment, our roofs, uh, our ability to collect water on an individual household basis or a suburb basis, um, the use of more energy efficient appliances, so energy efficient washing machines, dishwashers, um, uh, toilets and so on, and reusing our water, so grey, grey water recycling on a household scale. I think along with that we need economic instruments such as uh, reducing the uh, obligatory supply of potable water perhaps to uh, below 50% of what we currently supply so it throws the onus on the householder to look at alternative ways of, uh, of, of finding local solutions to the water supply problem. Uh, and on top of that of course there are all the technological fixes that we can use um, water saving shower heads and taps and so on. So it's a combination of technology, economics uh, and changing the conditions within which we view the supply obligation in order to try to really change the framework and reduce our, our water use. Climate change, population growth, the decline of rivers, we're all facing these issues globally. Here in Australia we're at the sharp end of having to respond to it and I think there's lessons we can all learn from it. The key points as to what we need to do different is we need to recognise that we haven't got a water supply problem, we've got a water governance problem. It is how we are allocating water, how we're encouraging it, smarter usage, and the framework, the organisations that drive those behaviours and those decisions. Specifically, we need to take uh, five steps. Firstly, we need to get serious about giving the environment what it needs, not to just leave the environment for what's left after we've taken our share. So get serious about looking after the environment. Number two, we need to encourage diversity. We need to encourage competition from a variety of suppliers, whether that's uh, from uh, stormwater harvesting or wastewater reuse or what other innovative sources of water. We need to move to a diversified a distributed solution rather than a central monopoly provider. Thirdly, we need independent regulation. The provider of water can't be the rule maker as well. You need to separate those responsibilities. Fourthly, we need to make water reform happen. And that's a government responsibility. They need to understand the reforms that need to happen in government departments and regulators to drive diversity, drive innovation, so government's got a role, but mostly and most importantly it's about you. It's about you letting your politician know that you are prepared to pay for sustainable water. Politicians haven't got that message at the moment and they believe that we, we the world, is prepared to accept the trade-off. We know how to fix it, we have the technology, we just need to get the governance arrangements right to drive it. So every single person listening to this, go and talk to your politician and let them know how much you are prepared to pay for sustainable water. Thanks. I have two points to talk about. One is um, a city is a urban ecosystem and, it, and that's made up of um, natural systems. 
and these natural systems are like the water cycle, the carbon cycle, the nitrogen cycle. So tonight we're looking at water, so that's what we're looking at. And if a urban area or city interrupts these cycles, then you need to repair these cycles. And, and by repairing them, you need to mimic the natural cycles. And water sensitive design is one of those elements that are mimicking nature. Um, the second premise I work on is a city is a water catchment and storage area. Because you, if you look at a city, there's a huge area of roofs and in, 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 in impervious paving. And that's a fantastic water catchment because the water just runs off it. And when you compare it to a natural inner, inner environment, you've got about 58% of surface runoff in the city. In a natural inner, inner environment, there's only about 23%. So you're actually cat it's far better than a natural in a, in environment to catch your water. The big trick is, is how do you store the water? Well, we can store it on roofs, on walls, and in the pavement, and these are the techniques we're using. So that brings you to green roofs, and green roofs are really good in this part of water catchment and water sensitive design, because it's the first bit where the rain hits, and you can actually save between 70 and 100% of the water in a green roof, depending on the depth of the roofs. I'm Sharon Pittman, and I'm talking about gardens of the future and just how much we need them. I mean, contrary to the, to the way some people have been talking, saying that gardens should be smaller, we shouldn't have them anymore, we can't afford them for their water use, we need gardens more than ever. We need them for lots of reasons. We need them for shade and privacy and protection. We need them for cooling and evaporation of our homes. We need them for habitat. They're incredibly important for habitat throughout urban areas. And we need them to help absorb more water into the soil so our houses are more protected. So we need them for a lot of reasons. And the thing about the gardens of the future is they're going to be really smart. They're going to be very, very clever. They're going to be much better designed, they're going to have incredibly clever features, they're going to use water in, in very clever ways, uh, they're going to provide excellent habitat, they're going to use lots of recycled products, they're going to be more energy efficient than ever before, um, they're going to use much less chemicals than we've used previously in our gardens. Um, there, some of them are going to be on rooftops and on vertical walls. They're going to be good in small spaces so that people can't say, oh, I have no room for a garden. Um, they're going to make sense. They're going to be in tune with our landscape. Uh, they're going to be designed well to use the water available, the sun available. Um, they're going to think of things like fire risk and frost risk, and they're going to provide uh, food and shelter for butterflies and birds and geckos. They're just going to be so smart that we're going to wonder why we didn't have these gardens many years ago.